So for the paper, the final paper, I said it was an argument in the best day. So you have to pick a side on the issue. You can't say, well, I don't know, or I guess both are right. Like, that's not going to work for this paper. You're going to have to tell me exactly, you know, do you agree or not with Judith Jarvis Thompson and her defense of abortion, for example? Why do you not? Why do you? So it's going to have to be clear. So what I'm expecting for the final paper, you it's a thesis paper. You're writing the thesis. A thesis is just basically a conclusion, if you're not familiar. So remember we spent all that time doing logic and arguments, premise, premise, conclusion. This is why I spent all that time doing that, because you're going to do it now for the paper. So your thesis is your conclusion. That's what you're going to prove. Your premises are the reasons to back up your conclusion. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. So, for example, this is from another uh, semester. This is what a thesis would look like. A thesis is just one sentence, usually. It says, I will argue in this paper the reasons and conditions argued by Bonnie Steinbach for the impermissibility of adultery conflicts with Aristotle's version of virtue ethics for the following reasons. One sentence, and it tells me a lot. One, it tells me who you're going to argue about, like what the paper, who wrote the paper, right? So I know who you're talking about. For the impermissibility of adultery, what you're talking about and what theory you're gonna use from class to back up what you're gonna say. And so virtue ethics is the example here. So I need those three things in your thesis. Make sure who you're talking about, what the topic is, and how you're gonna argue for or against using one of the theories we talked about in class. Questions about that? Okay, first is what is your topic, and then what is your side? Then uh, what is the theory? Well, first, it's who you're talking about, right? Okay. So that's why Bonnie Steinbach is a philosopher, and then she's talking about adultery, and this person is saying it conflicts with what they believe Aristotle was saying. With okay. Experience. I love like all these background sounds going on. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine, fine. Just as long as it's not like, I don't know, like some crazy like construction work or something. But I mean, you know, we live virtually, so we have to adapt. Okay, so people ignore, I think I've seen some students do this previous semesters. They ignore the thesis and don't spend a lot of time here. That's a mistake. Your thesis is your conclusion. It's your whole point of the paper. If it's not clear and solid, then what's the point? Like, if you don't know how to, like, what you're trying to prove, then what's the point of reading this paper if you don't know what you're trying to prove? So make sure it's absolutely good. I would say spend a lot of your time doing this, filling this out. What's your conclusion and what reasons are going to back up your conclusion? Because that's going to be the whole structure of your paper. Speaking of structure, this is what I was told and I'm passing it down. 80% of writing a paper is done in the outline. And that's a big mistake that I see a lot of students make as well. They start writing, or actually, you know what they do? They sit in front of a computer, like right now, in front of a blank screen, and wait for magic to happen. Like, they're just gonna get inspired, and then they're gonna have it all out there. And then they sit there, they look at their phone, and then 
two hours pass by and they have nothing. Don't do that. Do not do that to yourself because you're going to try to rush it and stay up all night and you're worried about a virus and then now you're trying to write a paper at three in the morning. It's a bad idea. So do an outline first. Follow this outline. I'm giving you an outline to follow. So this is what the paper should look like in structure. The first thing should be your thesis paper in your introduction. That's the first thing I should see. Like the example I gave right now, I will argue in this paper. That's what I should see first. Don't try to fluff it up with some other bullshit about <clears throat> since the beginning of time and all that bullshit. It's wasting my time and it's wasting your time, like it's not getting to the point. What's the point? Clear? So just tell me what you're arguing <clears throat> from the beginning, and then you're going to follow up with your reasons, like I said right here. Now, keep in mind, for this paper, there's not really a limit to how many reasons you can have in an argument, but I don't want you guys to go overboard, and I don't want you guys to go under. Either. So two to three is what it should be. You should have two to three reasons to back up what you're saying. One reason is going to be really poor, and four gets really messy. Is that clear? And this is going to be in conjunction with uh, whatever argument or whatever theory we're going to uh, wrap this up with, right? Exactly. Okay. So I'm going to get into that right now. So, <clears throat> sorry, I'm dying. But we're all dying, so it's okay. Um, a roadmap, what I mean by a roadmap is just a small preview of what's coming up. So what you do in a roadmap is you say, it's just like a paragraph or too long. All you do in a roadmap is say, uh, first, I'm going to discuss this. Second, then I'll talk about this. And third, you're just giving the reader a heads up. That's what I mean by roadmap. So that's the introduction. Thesis, reasons, and then what's coming up. That should be it. Then when you get to the body, this is where you really start working your argument. So I know what your conclusion is. As you told me in the beginning. So how are you going to back it up? You have to lay the foundation. The foundation here is what the author said. So you have to summarize, well, what did they say in their paper? What was it about? If it was a, the abortion paper, why did they believe that abortion was permissible in, some, in most cases? Like, how did they argue that? So you have to explain what they said. So you're laying that foundation there, and then you're going to tell me, since I already know whether you agree or disagree with what you're saying, you're going to tell me what theory, and you're going to explain what theory you're going to use to back it up. So whatever ethical theory we talked about during the semester, how are you going to use that? So first thing for the body, explain what the author's argument is. Not every single detail, just the important stuff, and then explain what the important stuff about the theory you're going to use. So your reader knows what you're talking about. That's stage setting, what we call stage setting. Then you're going to follow in, since you already explained the theory, reason one and reason two are how you're going to use that theory to back it up. Questions so far? Then this is the objection part. This is what I was talking about. In the objection, you're going to have to make the paper balanced. So you can't just assume, oh, 
I'm, I know I'm right, and I don't need to worry about what anybody else has to say. Here you're going to actually try to anticipate what the other side's going to say. So if you're arguing for it, then what is somebody going to say who's against it? So what would they say against one of your reasons? So if you said it was okay for this reason, like for abortion, it was okay if the woman was raped, then it's okay for that. What would somebody say who's against that? And then you'll have to have a counterexample. So then you have an answer against them. Say, so, okay, they try to say this, well then that doesn't really affect my argument because this, this, and this. So you see, it's a conversation. It's like you give your side, you give the other side, and then you respond back with a good answer. Now, your paper has to have at least one objection. And you have to have an answer to at least one objection. You can have more than one. That's actually a stronger paper. The more objections you respond to, the more convincing it is at the end. But you should have at least one. Because if it's just one-sided and you just talk about your side, I'm going to be really skeptical as a reader to believe you. Is that clear for everybody? Okay. And then at the end, <clears throat> your conclusion, you're just summing it up. Just like, <clears throat> excuse me. Just like the introduction, I set out to prove this. I explained reason number one, reason number two, blah, blah, blah. I answered this objection with this response. Therefore, this is why what I'm saying is right. And then, of course, at the end, you should have a reference page. So your reference is either APA or MLA, but it's always on a second sheet. It's on its own separate sheet. You can't just stick it right next to the conclusion. You have to skip down to another page and then put your reference page. That's what your paper should look like. That's the final. I don't know if that was too long, but I hope I answered everybody's questions. I have a question. Yes. Uh, how many references do we need to have on the end of the paper? That's why I said it's kind of open. Um, for sure, you're going to have one, the paper that you're writing about, right? Yes. Uh, probably the book, because you're going to talk about a theory from the book. If you want more, that's completely up to you. Okay. So we just have to do like how you mm. said, like if we find something online, we have to make sure with you first to see if it's good, then we can use that as a reference as well? Well, yeah, so I mentioned in the syllabus uh, that there's the, or also on the assignment, if you look on Blackboard, uh, there are a couple of sources, the links, like the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. I would say if you're trying to look for more stuff outside of the book, start there first. So search what you want there first. I would say it's like a legit wiki for philosophy. So Thank start you. there. And then you can cite that too and they have explanations of how you cite that. Um, and then what else? Um, and I would say for the most part books, reputable journal articles, stuff like that. Uh, I'm really skeptical about websites because it's not like a lot of people check websites. So that kind of stuff. I If it's a website, run it through me, I guess. That's what I'm saying. Um, but if it's a book, a journal article, the encyclopedia article, that would be fine. Good? Yes. Okay. So quick thing I tell all my students about paraphrasing. 
when I say paraphrase, what I don't mean is just change some of the words around or just take out some of the words. It's not paraphrasing. And I'll explain why. So here's an example. This PowerPoint is, like I said, available and I'll upload this as well. But here's a really good example of why you can't just take out some words and make it sound good. Um, so this uh, quote is from David Hume, which we talked about. Um, if you remember natural law, he was a skeptic. And he says, all the perceptions of human mind resolve themselves into two distinct kinds, which I shall call impressions and ideas. The difference betwixt these consists in the degrees of force and liveliness with which they strike upon the mind and make their way into our thought or consciousness. These perceptions which enter with the most force and violence, we may name um, impressions, and on this name I kept for him all our sensations, passions, and emotions, as they make their first appearance in the soul. By the ideas, I mean the faint images of these in thinking and reason. Did anybody understand what he was talking about? Then somebody explain. What is he saying? Any volunteers? He's just giving an in depth explanation between. Uh, what he believes is um, perceptions of humans, and that's um, ideas and impressions and how they imprint on the psyche. Okay, what does that mean? Damn. Because <laughs> um, if I didn't understand this, do you see how if you say that, but in shorter words, I'm still confused. So this is what I don't want you guys to do. I don't want you to do that. What I want you to do, this is what I would say is a reasonably good paraphrase. Hume says that there are two kinds of perceptions or mental states. He calls, he calls these impressions and ideas. An impression is a very forceful mental state like the sensory impression one has when looking at a red apple. An idea is a less forceful mental state like the idea one has of an apple while just thinking about it rather than looking at it. It's not so clear what he means here by forceful, he might mean blah, blah, blah. But do you see what they did there? What did they do that was different than the one at the top? Putting it in their own words? More than that. Did this example give you any, did this, I'm sorry, did this paragraph give you any particular examples? <clears throat> No, it didn't illustrate. Like if you're confused what he was saying here, you're still confused. But you see how this person said, well, there's a difference between looking at a red apple and closing your eyes and imagining a red apple, right? Mm -hmm. So now I understand better what he's talking about. So that's what I'm looking for. Make it easier for your reader. I think I said it in class a bunch of times. Imagine that your reader is lazy and stupid. So you're going to make it as easy and clear as you can. If you make it just as confusing of what, as you, what you read, I'm not going to be convinced. Like you're trying to convince your reader, not bore your reader into the light. Well, I don't care. So keep that in mind. There's another example here, but I want you guys to take a look at it on your own and think about it. how would you say that in an easier way, whatever Sal said there. So to move on, because I don't want to spend, take everybody's time, but it's not like everybody has anywhere to go either. But still, um, I know people still have things to do. Citations, MOA or APA. There are some similarities, but there are differences. So make sure you know those. 
um, the grading rubric, how I'm going to grade the paper. I'm going to look at formatting. I'm going to grade it on a scale. Exceptional, satisfactory, needs improvement, and poor. So with the formatting, I mean is that did you follow all the checklist items that I specified in the instructions? Did you get 12 point times new enrollment? Did you double space? Those kind of things. Really easy to make sure you have. Grammar, of course. You have to understand what you're saying. Organization. Highly suggest you follow my outline. Organize it the way I had it up on the outline. That'll probably be the easiest for you to do. And the last part is the real substance. The reasons, objections, and responses, and original examples. So what reasons did you give to back it up? What objections did you say in response to what you said? And what are the responses to those objections? Did you give good examples to explain yourself? So that's the real philosophy part. That's why I say I should be convinced. But it goes down the line. So very poor is that what you said, your reasons, your just didn't support anything. That would be the worst version.